life cycle is a few weeks long and they die off and start to decompose in your lash follicles. And that causes inflammation oh and my. they're... they're <laughs> Their excrement, their, they, what they're putting out of their little bodies, that causes a lot of inflammation. And all of this inflammation can be linked to ocular rosacea. And in fact, anywhere from 65 to 85%, a huge portion of rosacea patients also have dry eye. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Rose. Thank you so much for having me. I was just saying, this is so exciting. I love coming on this show. I know. Well, we were talking the last time about castor oil and how it could be helpful to use around the eye area. And then I started asking you after the episode about Demodex mites. And you're like, oh, we could do a whole My thing on house. that. Yes. Right? And yes. I feel like because so many people struggle with issues around their, like the, A, the face, but also so many people have rashes around the eyes. I do, and, and we've got people who have ocular rosacea as another potential sign. And sometimes the ocular rosacea will come in conjunction with facial rosacea. I thought this was like extremely apropos because I also know with rosacea, there's a connection with demodex mites. So that being said... Um, I want to talk first about blepharitis to basically set the stage. It's one of those weird terms that I assume most people are going to be like, I don't know what that is. So what is blepharitis? And are there any common or uncommon symptoms or signs that would help the listeners know whether this might actually be going on? Absolutely. So to oversimplify, and there are all kinds of different subsets of blepharitis, anterior blepharitis, posterior blepharitis, squamous blepharitis. So we don't need to get into the weeds, but to oversimplify, it's think of it just like eyelid inflammation. Something is causing your eyelids to be angry and upset. And almost always it's not in isolation as well. So you'll also have ocular surface disease accompanying with that. So the the eyelid inflammation then leads to SPK or meibomian gland dysfunction. These are these are usually diagnostics diagnostic codes that don't run in isolation. So usually you'll have a few different things going on, but what the patient may experience is um, eyelid rim redness or irritation or crusting in the morning when you wake up, or it's almost like you always have this buildup in your lashes. And that's a basically a summary of blepharitis. It's eyelid irritation. And I'm sure we're going to dive into it. There are tons of things we can do about it. And what's really exciting is it's constantly changing. We're getting more and more and more we can do for it than even just a few years ago. So it's a really hot topic right now. And it's really exciting because there's actually a lot we can do for it from extreme end stage to mild to preventative. So we can talk all of it. And so if someone is experiencing this type of like redness around the rim of the eyes or that crusting, I think, is it helpful for them to know, is that a time when you should probably go get that checked or is that something to like wait and see on? Well, it depends. Um, wh why don't we, we can go over some kind of preventative and at home therapies. And then if you're doing these preventative at home therapies and it clears in like a week or two, perfect. Any chronic condition, always see your eye care provider, especially now because we have very simple things you can do about it. So there's no need to sit on it and wait for it because most of these things in the ocular surface, the, the front of the eye, they get worse over time. So usually if you sit on it for too long, it becomes a bigger deal, a bigger fire to put out. One thing I say a lot is put the fire out, keep the fire out. The longer you sit on it, the bigger your fire grows, the more we're going to have to throw on you. That doesn't mean it's um, impossible to get back to where you were. It's just maybe more steps. Yeah. Okay. We'll circle back with the preventative stuff closer to the end of this, because I think that's a really good point that you make. So now that we know what blepharitis is, I think this is where the conversation the last time stemmed from. 
I did not realize that there's actually a pretty big connection between blepharitis and demodex mites, which for listeners, you know that we have talked about demodex mites before, especially in conjunction with rosacea. So what's the connection? How are demodex mites tied to blepharitis? So Demodex is a naturally occurring parasite. Um, Most of us have it. If you look in the literature, anywhere from 30% to 100% prevalence. It's very, very common. So when I am talking with my patients about this, I will say, don't get grossed out. You're not an outlier. This is very, very common. The issue is when it becomes overgrown. So what Demodex does, it looks like this. I I believe it's in the arachnid family. It has these eight little legs. And on the skin and eyelids, there are, I want to say, somewhere around 65 different types of Demodex. And in humans, we're really just working with two different types. And it's in the skin, it's in the hair follicles, it's in the lashes, it's in the brows. And what usually happens and how it can get so overgrown, a number of different ways, but Uh, We've talked a few times, we all have these oil glands in our lid margins. And if those oil glands become dysfunctional, the oil gets stagnant and thicker. And I tell my patients, it's almost like it becomes fast food for these bugs. And they get so happy and they're feeding like crazy. And then they get overpopulated. And what happens then is um, they can actually, well, they die off. The life cycle is a few weeks long and they die off and start to decompose in your lash follicles. And that causes inflammation. Oh and my. they're their <laughs> their excrement, they're, they, what they're putting out of their little bodies, that causes a lot of inflammation. <laughs> and all of this inflammation can be linked to ocular rosacea. And in fact, anywhere from 65% of rosacea patients 65 to 85%, a huge portion of rosacea patients also have dry eye. These things run in circles together, probably because this little guy, right? He's crawling all over your face and eyes, reproducing and very, very happy with this, this inflammatory condition. And so, um, as you can see, this is the reaction a lot of my patients give me. Like, are you kidding? Well, right, because I'm thinking to myself, this is horrifying, <laughs> To imagine these little tiny critters dying and basically pooping on you. Pooping all over. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And you can imagine that causes a lot of inflammation and uncomfortable eyes. And so we we start to have the conversation of what to do about it and how to handle the die-off process can also cause some irritation. But it's very, very common, and there are lots we can do about it. So it's not something the patient's doing wrong. It's not like you're gross and you have this, you know, parasitic infection because of something you're doing. It's naturally occurring. It just is an opportunistic infection think of it kind of like that. And it gets really happy with these poor conditions. So getting back to homeostasis, hopefully will neutralize the Demodex overgrowth. This episode is brought to you by my line of professional grade supplements called NutraQuel. I crafted these supplements, especially for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues and based the formulations on my extensive research and clinical experience in my private practice. They are made from the highest quality ingredients and tested to be free of different allergens so that you can support your gut, liver, and overall health with the formulas that I found work best for my skin rash warrior clients without triggering a flare. I'm excited to share them with you. So check them out at quellshop.com and use the coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. And I think that's important to clarify for people that demodex mites normally live on the skin. They're, I guess we could call them a commensal, so to speak. But mm-hmm. what, you clari- what you clarified for me is that it's really about the level, the amount, and the overgrowth state is the problem. It's not to get to zero, That's not the goal. It's to bring the level down to a place where they're living more in harmony with the rest of the organisms living within the microbiome of, I guess, the skin, we would say. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And it's been something us um, dry eye docs specifically have been talking about for years. And we have a lot we can do about it. But now we have so many more options that we're having these conversations so much more frequently. And it is completely in conjunction with rosacea. And so we usually like to address the skin and eyes because if we just take care of the eyes, they're just going to crawl right back up from the cheeks and the brows. So we really have to take care of the whole the whole overgrowth. And do you have any stats on who potentially is most at risk for developing this type of overgrowth? Are there certain age brackets that you tend to see? Or maybe we mentioned rosacea quite a bit, but any other conditions that might put you at a greater risk of developing this overgrowth? Absolutely. Um, Diabetics are going to be at higher risk. Also, 20 and 30 year olds usually get to escape clean from a lot of the prevalence. Usually 20 and 30 year olds are very healthy and unmarked by these. But 20 and 30 year olds are really high because they're producing a lot more mybum. Mybum is the oil, the specialized oil in the oil glands. They it usually produce a lot more mybum than other demographics. And so the Demodex is going to really love these patients. And then also it's up to 100% prevalence as the older you get as well, over 60, over 70. So 20 and 30, over 60, diabetics, rosacea, and humans. They're in humans, right? Humans. (laughs) Yes. And so it sounds like, you know, again, we're going to talk about the prevention part of this. So that sounds like that's an important part of what will help keep these organisms in check. (laughs) So I guess my question is, you know, this is something where like many of you know, my dad was an ophthalmologist and I unfortunately don't recall him ever mentioning demodex mites. So as you were talking, I'm thinking like, how do you even discern If this is Demodex, is there a test? What do you do? That's an awesome question. So their Demodex leave signs. So they actually don't love bright light. And to look at eyeballs, we shine bright lights in your eyes, right? And so what happens is we shine a bright light in your eyes and the Demodex crawls into the lash follicle. So we don't usually actually see the demodex itself. But we see these, what's called, it's pathognomonic is um, if we see something called a collarette, you have demodex. So a collarette, when I look in a microscope, it kind of looks like a, um, a cuff of clear buildup around a lash. And so I see that you have demodex for sure. But what what it looks like to the patient is almost like dandruff in your lashes. It, it, that's the best way I can describe it. In the microscope, it doesn't look that much like it, but that's a good way to describe it. And then really just red irritated eyelid margins are also indicators that this might be present and a problem in this patient. Now, a handful of optometrists out there that I know of personally have microscopes um, in their exam lanes. And what they'll do is pluck a lash if they're suspecting it, but they don't see signs of Demodex. Pluck a lash, put the lash on a slide in the microscope, and we can actually see them swimming around. So it's fascinating. We can pull them in real time and observe them. Anymore, we don't necessarily need to do that. If we see things like collarettes and scurf and different buildup, we we know it's there. It's almost just for fun to pluck lashes and watch these little guys dance. But um, we rarely see them specifically because they don't love bright lights. Interesting. They don't like bright lights. Okay. They are very happy at night, so they re- they do all their reproduction at night. Is that perhaps why you get that really crusty buildup at night while you sleep? And in the morning when you wake up, absolutely. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right, so it sounds like, number one, your optometrist and even an ophthalmologist could potentially absolutely. look for this. Mm-hmm. So how do we, if you have this... How do you treat for it? Because I know with rosacea, sometimes they will use topical ivermectin on the face, um, but I, I don't I don't know what the eye options would be for that. I love it. Topical ivermectin, we do, like I said, we would also need to clean up the cheeks and the surrounding area. So we do a decent amount of topical compounded ivermectin here for our dry eye patients. 
Uh, but that's not safe around the eyes. So our hands have been tied. Um, I, I recommend a lot of lid hygiene. So I'm always talking to everyone about lid hygiene, whether I see signs of it or not. We want to keep that microbiome in check. We want to make sure the makeup debris and allergen debris and anything that the Demodex might like to feed on, we clean it up, get it out of there. We're limiting its food supply. So twice a day, lid wash. Um, don't just use your typical eye makeup removers. There are specialized products for eyelid hygiene. My favorites have a tea tree oil component in it because tea tree oil is effective at killing Demodex. Now, the tea tree oil needs to be in reduced concentration enough because obviously that will burn like fire if it's too spicy. Some of my favorites also have an oil-based component, so it's almost like the oil's going to smother it. And we've talked before about castor oil. The research is mixed on castor oil. There hasn't been much specific castor oil demodex eyeball crossover, but the theory is it's going to suffocate and smother the demodex. So I am happy with that as well. But I love an oil-based tea tree oil eyelid wash twice a day. And then there are also okra-based cleansing products that you can use at home that kill Demodex. And then once we get into the in-office procedures, IPL that we've talked about a bunch for cutting the inflammation also tackles Demodex because it's literally, it's thermal blasting this Demodex, it's frying it. And we've seen that in real time. You blast a Demodex with IPL and it just dies almost immediately. Now, one thing to think about with IPL is the Demodex has laid eggs while it's in there. So we also have to let the life cycle of the eggs to larva to adult come through to repeat killing off the Demodex within the first, I'd say eight weeks is really the time frame to get the adult larva or the adult Demodex that's there, all the larva, the eggs, and continue the treatment through this entire life cycle of a couple of generations, or else it's just going to come right back. And then we also have in-office lid debridements. So I explain it to patients kind of like an eyelid facial to where we're actually doing micro exfoliation and those okra based products in a stronger concentration to kill all of it in office in a one setting treatment. These are usually very comfortable, very relaxing. Your eyes feel so clean after. So we have at home lid wash. We have in-office lid margin cleaning, like an eyelid facial. We have IPL, and those have been our mainstays for a few years now. Our hands have been tied beyond that, uh, topical ivermectin around the face. But as of just within the last couple of months, we now actually have a pharmaceutical. This is brand new, first of its kind. I believe I'm pronouncing this properly, I'm so sorry if I'm saying it right, wrong, but it's lodolinear is the medication and it's one drop twice a day for six weeks. And what this is, is it's a parasite specific, I don't want to mess this up, a GABA gated, let me see, GABA gated chloride channel inhibitor. So it's selected for these parasites very low side effects, obviously burning upon installation, just like pretty much any eye drop, but it seems to be really effective at taking care of these mites. And so what this looks like to me is depending on the spectrum of overgrowth you have, right? If it's mild, we're talking about at-home therapy. If it's moderate, we're doing at-home therapy, IPL, especially if you have concurrent inflammation, which most of the time you do. So we're talking about getting the oil glands back in check with omegas, hot compresses, there are a lot we can do to restore balance and then um, in office cleaning. And then if it's pretty advanced, we're doing all of it. We're doing IPLs and in office cleaning and home therapy and a medication. But within these two months, we'll get you taken care of and cleaned up and back to normal. It's a very exciting time to be an ocular surface disease doctor because we have so many more tools than we ever had before. 
I can I can tell you're very enthusiastic about it, which I'm sure is awesome. And so I want to I know just from having been in the rooms with my dad, I know there's some questions as you were talking. So I think they would Mm -hmm. be helpful to clarify for listeners. So first of all, you should not go out and buy a bottle of tea tree oil and put that on your eyes. No, absolutely not. That will cause a lot of damage. Absolutely not. And honestly, don't try to create one either. There are products on the market that are probably as cheap as if you tried to build it yourself. And it's already made for you and they work very well. Okay. So please, please don't. Please don't, don't do that. And then you were saying there's also okra based products mm-hmm. as well. And those are those also available over the counter? They are okra okay. based uh, lid foams and they will they're also selective against these parasites. OK, perhaps we and can put those the, in the show notes. Sure. Too yeah, when I'll we're done. Get, yeah. Yep. I'll get those products over to you. Awesome. Some of my favorites that I use personally as well. I am a dry eye patient, so I use these. I know the pain. Awesome. And then you mentioned that IPL, which is a a laser, correct? It's not technically a laser. It's intense pulse light. It's a light therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you said, I think you said you can fry the Demodex mites. And as I'm listening to this, I can imagine someone might go, is that going to fry my eye or my like eyelid? So with IPL, we now have hundreds of peer reviewed studies and safety protocols and FDA approval. And we don't actually go on the lash line directly because that will get rid of your lashes, but there's this thermal bloom. So, so we get close to it within a couple of millimeters. And so the heat and the intense light energy that we deliver also kills these Demodex off, but very safely. In my clinic, we use laser grade corneal shields. We've been doing, I do eight IPLs a day on near the eyes for the last, you know, three years. It's been very, very safe super effective. Um, I will give a caveat. If you do have an intense overgrowth of Demodex, as we're doing these in-office treatments, you can get this die-off period where the inflammation kind of flares because we're killing them all at once. And so we do have to manage that a little bit. That's where we also do the lid margin debridement and the pharmaceuticals to try to help prevent that. But absolutely, it works very effectively. Okay. And also in regards to the topical ivermectin, I I just, I know some people will go online and find things or say that they have something. So again, to be clear, topical ivermectin is not to be not put. Not to go in the eyes. So we don't put, do we want to stay basically around the, the circle orbital of rim. the eye? Yep. The orbital rim, just like retinol. You want to okay. stay away from it. And I will get you, we we can compound them with our local pharmaceuticals, but I'm also pretty sure there is a pharmacy that has this specialized, almost like a little rosacea blend that also has a few vitamins in it that are helpful. I'll get that over to you as well. Awesome. We can so put then all you that- can ask your, if your doctor is like, I have no idea what you're talking about, then you can say, well, here's a product that I've heard works really well and it makes it easier for them as well. I'll get that over to you. Yeah. Awesome. I love being able to add different tools to the show notes, especially because you might have somebody who has, who struggles with o- the okra based option or maybe Absolutely. the tea tree. And so like they have different options to, like you said, bring to their doctor and get the help that they need. So mm-hmm. can we talk a little bit about preventative because you mentioned that that is really important and maybe doing some of that could help get you to a place where maybe you don't necessarily need to go see the doctor. Um, What would some prevention for this uh, Demodex mite driven or overgrowth blepharitis be? I like to start at the basics and I recommend this for everyone. Hot compresses, blink exercises, a triglyceride form omega, and then the lid wash, lid wash, lid wash, lid wash. So wash your eyes. And we think about brushing and flossing twice a day. I know I'm religious about that. And no one, not many people think about washing their eyes and taking care of that as well. And especially if you wear cosmetics, especially if you have allergies, but I like it for everyone at least once a day, preferably twice a day. Doing those things specifically will help a lot. If you also have rosacea, getting that under control and then um, rebalancing your skin barrier 
right? So anything like that will help keep this under control. And when you talk about washing the eyes, I would assume, obviously, we're talking about eyelids more specifically. So don't Mm -hmm. wipe your eyeball itself. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And so I, my preference, as long as a patient can tolerate it, and there are no tea tree oil allergies, I have my favorite that I'll get you over is a two-step process. It's an oil and a foam. I tell the patient, wash your hands, put a drop or two of the oil on your finger, rub it together, close your eyes and go into circles in the, uh, the base of the lash. Cause remember these little guys live in the lash follicle. So really go into circles to get to the base of the lash. And I go all the way up to my eyebrow as well, because they're in the brows and the lashes. So this whole area clean, um, oil, circular foam, circular rinse with water. Okay. And then it becomes, and it's a great makeup remover. So you can eliminate taking off your eye makeup and just do this. And it's a two-step punch. It takes care of the Demodex. It cleans the makeup off. And um, how do I say this? Anecdotally, a lot of my patients say that their lashes start growing a lot longer too when you do these things. Probably because there's a decrease in inflammation within Absolutely. that hair follicle. Um, and I, I think this are good points to make. So the over-the-counter makeup remover towelettes that, you know, I'm sure people use to remove makeup, those are not going to be helpful in removing Demodex Not mites. nearly as helpful. I'll get you a brand that is going to be more helpful of the pre-moistened towelettes. And then another thing I forgot to mention is hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is great for Demodex and rosacea over the counter. And what you do, it's the last step in your hygiene. You close your eyes, you spray it on your eyelids, brows. I go all over because it's great for your skin as well. And then you just let it, you leave it on, let it dry. So that's a really easy thing to do as well as hypochlorous acid. And this would also be the reminder to potentially not reuse, like if you wipe your face with a uh, washcloth or something, you should not be reusing the same washcloth multiple times. Would that be an accurate statement? Absolutely. And you bring up a good point. Change your pillowcases frequently too, because these guys are um, spread through contact. And so change your sheets and pillowcases frequently as well. And if you have this, then what if you wear an eye mask at night? I um, I wear an eye mask at night. I have multiple and I wash them frequently. Okay. So just get a multi-pack and throw it in your laundry. Perfect. I mean, I mm-hmm. this is, okay, so first of all, I will admit the whole, the whole overgrowth thing. It's <laughs> kind of cringy. Kinda it's yes. kind of gross. It makes your skin crawl. I know. It does. It does. But it's good for us to know and to have a nuanced conversation about it because I didn't I didn't know a whole lot about this until we started talking about it. And I feel like given that there's such a connection between Demodex and rosacea and people who have this irritation around their eyes, and we've also talked on the Healthy Skin Show about ocular surface disease for those who you know, may choose to do a biologic like Dupixent where some people, there's a pretty, I think it's like 30 some percent of people who use Dupixent end up developing some more severe uh, Ocular type complications. Of, exactly. Absolutely. That's a huge one. So I think this is a really valid conversation to have. And I'll make sure too in the show notes to put our conversation about castor oil as well around the eyes since it could be a helpful partner it's in all this. Area. It's right. gray area. We're not sure, but it could be a helper. And we again, if it's cr- if you try it and it sticks around, go see your eye care provider. There are so many solutions that are now easily accessible, easy to use, low side effects, low risk. There's no reason to sit on this one. Awesome. Well, Dr. Rose, how can everybody find you? Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, a lot of different places. I am on TikTok. It's just Dr. Rose all spelled out on Instagram. My handle is Dr. Rose talks. And then if you wanted to check out my med spa, so all of this, as we're talking, we have the dry eye cannot be separated from the skin. So because of that, I have developed a dry eye med spa because all of this goes hand in hand. And my patients are consistently impressed with the before and afters, not just of their eyeballs, but their skin. Because as we're taking care of this ocular surface disease, 
obviously the skin clears up because we're treating it all. And so it's hard to separate because the skin products you're using matter and the cosmetics you're using matter and the eyelid products you're using matter. And so that is the clear experience. I am also on YouTube, Dr. Rose Talks. I am on LinkedIn. There's a lot of places you can find me. Yeah. Anywhere you look. That is awesome. Well, I mean, I am so grateful that you have decided to come back to the show. This is now your third interview. I'm so I grateful that you're here. And thank you for having I'm, me. Yeah, I'm excited for everybody to hear this. And thank you so much for constantly being so willing to share your knowledge with everyone else. I love it. I appreciate it. And thank you. Feel free to reach out. It, this is an exciting time to have. It's an exciting time to have dry eye and rosacea because we can do things about it now. Awesome. If you enjoyed this video, you need to tune in to this video next. Then make sure to hit the subscribe button so you get notified as soon as a new episode drops. I'm excited to see you there and dive deeper with you on your skin healing journey.